Hello and welcome to The Virus. I'm Jeremy Fernandez. COVID restrictions are easing across a huge swathe of the country. Masks are coming off in most indoor venues in New South Wales, Victoria and the ACT. Queenslanders will have relaxed rules next week, but it's a different story in the West where rules have been tightened because of a surge of cases. So what does the future of the pandemic look like in Australia? Dr Norman Swan joins us shortly. Plus, we cross to Broome where health authorities are dealing with outbreaks in remote Indigenous communities. But first, case Casey Briggs joins us and Casey, while some states are finally seeing COVID cases decline, others are on the rise. Yeah, that's right, Jez. And of course, the West is the obvious example. Cases have shot up this week as across the rest of the country, we are still seeing uh, gradual improvement, but a lot slower uh, than we were earlier. About 23,000 cases a day is what we're seeing nationally. Now, a week ago, we were talking about 25,000 cases a day. And one of the things we've seen this week is that some of the smaller states are actually starting to see an increase in cases once again. Here's Tasmania, which has seen uh, an increase in the second half of this week. Similar story in Canberra. Now, it may just be a coincidence, but these are two states and territories where uh, the per capita case wave was lower than some of the bigger states and that means presumably there are more people uh, out there in these states and territories that are susceptible to the virus still because they haven't been recently infected. It's a similar story again in South Australia. Uh, this rise is a bit smaller but it is definitely still a rise this week uh, and it does coincide with the opening weekend of the uh, second biggest arts festival in the world, and that is the Adelaide Fringe. Well, we're yet to see if this will translate to an increase in hospitalisations. It won't necessarily. Uh, and nationally, as of Thursday night, we had a bit over 2,000 people being treated in Australian hospitals with COVID-19. Deaths, well, they are sitting right now at about 40 a day still, and that number is coming down. But again, it's coming down relatively slowly when you compare it to the speed at which it shot up at the start of this wave. And as the kind of urgency is coming out of it, we're still seeing a fair few deaths occurring and we're still nationally well below the optimal vaccine protection. About 44% of Australians now have had uh, three doses of a vaccine. There are still more than 7 million people eligible for that third shot, but yet to get it. And at the same time, we're seeing the pace of those booster shots coming down again, still in Australia, now looking at about 120, 130,000 doses uh, on a, an average weekday. So that pace is slowing down. And Jez, we're seeing some real stagnation among some of the youngest kids, five to 11 year olds as well. In about five days, that number has climbed from 49% to 49.5%. It's really looking like it's a slog to get to 50 on that vaccination coverage, Jez. Casey, thank you. Dr Norman Swan joins us now. Norman, we seem to be taking some big steps towards acceptance of COVID in the community. Mask mandates have been coming off rapidly, dispensing with QR code check-ins, density limits, borders are reopening. Where does this place us in the medium to long term? Well, it, you really, with COVID, got to just place yourself in the here and now. And the here and now is that with Omicron, we're coming off the peak. There are lower numbers of cases. And um, the judgment is that you can take off these restrictions to some extent because we are so well vaccinated and a lot of people have already got Omicron and we're reasonably well protected against a second Omicron infection. So all you can say is that for the time being, it's not a bad thing to do. And you can't really ask people to continue with measures when they're not absolutely needed at that moment because they may well be needed in the future. What is the reason for the lull that we're seeing right now? The lull is actually an international lull. It was predicted uh, a month or so ago where most countries in the world peaked around about the middle of February. By the middle of or to end of next month, March, uh, we will have uh, probably more than 50% of the world's population infected with Omicron. So you have a high level of vaccine of, of either natural infection and a growing level of, of immunisation, which is still not high enough in low income countries. So we're going to go into a lull, which will, we, nobody's right quite sure how long that's going to last. In Australia, we run the risk of a second Omicron wave, maybe with the BA2 subvariant um, in winter. Northern Hemisphere may well, that law may well last through the northern summer with, with warmer temperatures. But the, uh, we're at the prey of a new variant.
part of the comfort that we have at this point in time is that we're not being flooded with as much data as we were, say, two years ago, a year ago, even six months ago. Is that a good thing? Or are we setting ourselves up for difficulty in the future because we just don't have enough information about where the virus is popping up and what sort of variants are going around? We haven't learned a lot yet. About, um, uh, we haven't learned the lessons of this pandemic to date. Data are really what got us through to be able to feed back and control. So we, we need much better global surveillance of what is going on, understanding how the virus is adapting and, uh, and mutating. And also, and most importantly of all, I mean, the British have a group of British scientists who advise the British government have come up with four scenarios for the future. A couple of them are reasonably optimistic and two are quite pessimistic. And a lot of it depends on what happens with the new variants, the extent to which they're vaccine resistant. And here's the real worry is that if the virus goes back into an animal population and then spins back out into humans. If it does that, it could acquire genes which almost turn it into a new virus. So we do not yet have the global surveillance system in place that we need to, to actually watch for that happening and being able to control it and preventing it from spreading. So we're still pretty vulnerable and data are critical. How much does the approach of winter in the next few months extend that vulnerability? Well, this is going to turn out to be a seasonal virus, but when, uh, when, you, when it comes in waves, so the problem with this word endemic is the feeling is that, is, is that endemic implies stability, where you've got constant infection wherever you are in the world. This virus is going to come in waves, and that goes against endemicity, and there's no uh, is, there's no inevitability that it's going to become milder. It could become milder, more severe, less severe, the same, same level of severity. And going into winter, if we've got a severe wave coming in, it will swamp either the northern summer or our summer. Um, and winter just means that we're more enclosed, more likely to spread. And the worry, if we don't have a new variant, is this BA2 subvariant of Omicron, which could be more contagious and a bit more vaccine resistant. At the moment, it doesn't seem as if it's something to worry about. It doesn't seem to be more severe, but we could see more cases. None of our leaders have said we won't have restrictions ever again. How harsh do you think they will be if they do make a return? Um, masks are really important. So if you look at the British predictions, these four scenarios for the future, human behaviour is really important. It's important to remember that 1920 was the worst year of the 1918 pandemic. And it was because people were getting fed up and they were stopping you know, adhering to the social and public health measures. And the scenarios put out by the British largely depend on our willingness to go back to a degree of social distancing and, and mask wearing, not lockdowns, but those ones. Mask wearing is incredibly effective. So we have to be prepared to go back to that if we have to. Dr Norman Swan, thank you. You're welcome, Jess. And we've taken a closer look at how the pandemic might end on the ABC's Video Lab. This is what the word endemic looks like on a chart. The number of people infected with COVID-19 more or less stabilises over time, instead of showing big, unexpected surges like we're seeing now. So theoretically, a disease becomes endemic when its reproduction number, or R number, averages one over time. That means one infected person on average infects one other person, so the overall case burden doesn't go up or down. But it's not just about that R number. COVID-19 will become endemic when it's no longer an active crisis. That means that the level of severe disease and disruption to our lives falls down to an acceptable level. So who gets to decide what that is? You'll find more at abc.net.au slash video lab. The surge in the number of cases in WA has also hit a number of remote indigenous communities for the first time, including one south of Broome, Bijadanga. That's causing concern. Lorraine Anderson is the medical director at the Kimberley Aboriginal Medical Services. Dr Anderson, thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. 
You had been aiming for a 95% vaccination rate. For the whole country, it's only 78% of Indigenous people who are vaccinated. In WA, that falls to 70%. So all over the country, Aboriginal people are under-vaccinated. What impact is that going to have on the way this virus spreads, particularly through remote communities? The under-vaccination in our remote communities is a real concern. It's not just the remote communities. It's also some of the metro sites and some of the regional towns. In general, um, I have to say that many of our remote communities have a very good vaccination rate. So Bidjidanga, for example, the community that's having the outbreak at the moment, have got 96% of their population having had their first dose and 90% having had their second dose. And um, third dose or the um, booster dose, um, we're a little bit behind. We're only on 10% at the moment. So um, in general, um, some of the communities have got a very good vaccination rate, but there's others that have a very poor vaccination rate. And what we're worried about is that in those areas where there's a very poor vaccination rate, the, um, not only will the virus spread quickly, it's going to make people sicker. And we've, you know, we're very under-resourced in our regions um, in terms of what we can, uh, what our capacity is in our hospitals and in our clinics. And we're, that's what worries us. It worries us that we're going to have um, quite a peak in people who are going to re require hospitalisation. You've been dealing with hesitancy, complacency and mistrust in health authorities. Does the arrival of this virus now change the risk assessment for the people in those communities? Yes, it does. Now, um, there's no doubt um, what we've seen over in the eastern states is going to unfold here very quickly over the next couple of days. And that is that um, COVID has now become real for people in the northwest of WA. And so those people who were hesitant um, and, um, and just not sure about having the vaccine will probably change their mind now. So one of our responses is that we've got a lot of vaccinators out and about ready to vaccinate people. Uh, we're expecting quite an upsurge in the number of vaccinations that are going to be done over the next week. So what is the strategy at this point? Are you still aiming for COVID zero or is there going to be an acceptance that some people will get sick and some will die? So we have been aiming for COVID zero, but I think that that's unrealistic now. The, uh, the, the, what we're looking for now is to um, keep people as well as possible get everybody vaccinated before um, we have widespread community transmission in the remote communities. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, as I say, keep everyone as well as possible and just reduce, you know, flatten that curve. So reduce the number of people that are going to need hospitalizations. And uh, look, the other thing that, uh, the other thing that is going to be helpful for us is that we've, the Commonwealth have actually made available um, a lot of antiviral medication for us to have out in our remote communities. So uh, we've already got those. So we've got them available out in the community. So anyone who's not vaccinated, who fits the criteria for antiviral treatment, will be able to receive that antiviral treatment, even if they're in the most remote Aboriginal community in Australia. What is your assumption at this point of how far COVID has made it into these communities? At the moment, our assumption is that uh, we're dealing with an outbreak on the western uh, on the western side of the Kimberley. So, um, uh, so that is um, Bijidanga, um, Beagle Bay, and Broome. We know that there's some cases down in the Pilbara, and um, and we also know obviously that um, Perth and the south and the southwest of Perth have, um, have got cases. How far into our remote Aboriginal communities? I think we're probably only days off having it in most of our remote Aboriginal communities in the Kimberley. Are you concerned about the WA border opening next week? Uh, to be honest, Jeremy, I don't think it's gonna make a difference. Why is that? COVID is here for us in the Kimberley. Uh, I think that um, I'm probably speaking for most of the uh, regional areas in WA, in particular in the Northwest, is that um, if we've managed to get COVID into our remote communities with the caution that we've had so far, um, I think that the border opening is not really going to impact that much. In general, people coming across the border are not coming across and going out to remote Aboriginal communities. And uh, we do still have um, uh, restrictions and who can come and go from our remote Aboriginal communities. So, uh, so at the moment, really, you do have to be a community member or an essential service to be able to move in and out. So there is still some protection there. 
Dr Lorraine Anderson, thanks so much for your time. Thank you very much. And that is the show for this week. Thanks for your company from all of us. Bye for now.